And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck here as we move into the month of July here at the Mothership where it all began back in 1981 because of the one and only Mother Angelica, her vision. We're trying to continue that as best we can here. You can reach out to us on this particular programming through emailing us and Facebooking us and Twittering us and also checking out the Magic Center website where all things Father Spitzer can be found and the CredibleCatholic.com, which normally is what we're working through. But today, as we continue on with what's so special about the Catholic Church, uh, and a lot of people out there might be wondering about that, maybe more today than they have in the past, unfortunately. So that's why we thought it was an important topic that Father wanted to deal with. And speaking of important topics, we have a wonderful book uh, that has to do with Captivated by the Master, a theological consideration of Jesus Christ by the one and only great teacher on EWTN, Father Brian Malady, OP. He's great. His information is always precise and uh, quite understandable. Check that book out. It's available through our EW10 Religious Catalog, Father Malady, of course. And once again, we speak with another man and a wonderful priest who explains things at a level for us all to understand. Great to see you again, Father Spitzer. Oh, great to be here, Doug. And uh, I'll start with our prayer. Very good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. We ask that you uh, continue to watch our uh, country, our whole world this day, that uh, we may uh, uh, have an end uh, soon, uh, soon to this pandemic, and uh, uh, that those who have been harmed physically and fiscally uh, by it uh, may, be, uh, may be healed. We ask you also, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit down upon Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition uh, uh, in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we, we came out of last week with July 4th. A lot of interesting things going on. Yeah. Uh, a couple of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, after a couple of bad ones, I think we had last week or so, uh, uh, we had, looks like a good one. The Little Sisters of the Poor have, have won a big decision in the Supreme Court. Uh, I know they're going to have a, a whole conference about it later today, but the news seems to be good there. And they've been fighting for that Great. for quite a while. And uh, uh, writing for the majority, Justice Clarence Thomas said, for over 150 years, the Little Sisters have engaged in faithful service and sacrifice motivated by a religious calling to surrender all for the sake of their brother. So it looks like uh, they have won their case and their long sojourn That's of nine great. years should be over. So. That's great. And of course, it complements the Espinosa case that uh, basically uh, reversed the, the Blaine Amendment in uh, right. Montana, uh, which was a kind of a scourge on uh, religious uh, education and uh, you know being able to have money follow the student and be used uh, 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 in a religious education for school choice so that was a great victory mm -hmm. as well so there's some good things going on though the reversal of the Louisiana um, uh, right, uh, decision exactly. was uh, a little bit uh, uh, difficult to understand in light of the uh, uh, I thought some of the predispositions of the of the justices. So, uh, but uh, all in all, we're, um, uh, the Supreme Court is uh, doing some very very good things uh, for us here in the United States. Right, exactly. Supreme Court okay's religious and moral exemptions for birth control coverage. Obviously, that's part of that whole issue with the sisters. So that's also good news. Yeah. Uh, another thing that uh, you know makes you wonder. Obviously, we've had more of them. We talked a little about the. You know, Paracera statue, and then yeah. uh, Archbishop Corleone stood up about yeah. that, and, and others have gone, lay people have gone and stood up to protect statues and things like that. Why do you think there, uh, there is this iconoclasm out there, this, this attack on these kind of things, especially when you look at it and, and say, why are they attacking these particular people who in many ways did such good work? Is it because there's a lack of history being taught? Well, I, that, that's part of it. I mean, obviously, I think there is, um, um, you know, some rage in, in, out there in society, and sometimes you just you, you try to focus on, well, who, who might be to blame? You know, who, who's uh, uh, at the center of this? And y you might 
if you if you're ahistorical, if you mm -hmm. if you don't realize the good things Junipero Serra did, mm -hmm. the love that he had for those people, the the you know he tried to bring stability to things, protect the rights of the Indians, et cetera. If you, you ha if you have no idea of that, you could focus on one incident where you just say, well, his use of of corporal punishment, you mm -hmm. know, say to uh, to punish uh, the the Indians who were violators of of the law, which was very typical of the time, mm -hmm. uh, not just for Indians, but for others, right, this view of corporal punishment. We talked about, you know, uh, high group versus low group cultures um, and, and the difference between them. You know, Junipero Serra was a person of his culture and a person of his times, and so he, he, he did this. And, and true, we look at it today and go, well, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that seems, uh, you know, over the top. But for that time, it really wasn't over the top, mm -hmm. and there was an overriding love that he had. And, and certainly he stood up for the rights of the Indians. Certainly he tried to, to give a, a greater sense of community, certainly a greater sense of education. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no question about it, he did tremendous goods. But if you take one incident out, you know, look at it from a non-cultural perspective, non-historical perspective, mm -hmm. and then blow that up as the one thing that describes his life, mm -hmm. you're gonna come out with, you know, rage at Junipero Serra which um, uh, I don't think is justified in, in any way. Right. And, you know, you could say the same thing about anybody. Right, uh, exactly. So we could just, right. you, know, uh, you know, tear down every statue, tear down every uh, person who tried to do any good for anybody because, you know, they, they did things that by today's standards look bad, but in point of fact, by their own standards, it was typically accepted. Right. And, thought to be uh, good uh, or okay, certainly permissible. Well, it seems so, to be uh, that at case, some point you'd have to say the only two statues that should be out there are our Lord and our Lady. Yeah, that's right. right? Um, maybe not a bad idea. Just kidding. Right. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, we have to just put an end to, to the, you know, ahistorical, um, well, it's almost kind of a, you know, <laughs> You know, historical overwriting mm -hmm. um, with a, a truly, a, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying a snobbery uh, or, or an elitism, but it's, it's an imposition of our culture on the culture of the time. And, you know, just, you know, we look back 50 years ago and we can see the same accusation uh, going out there that, you know, well, people were imposing their culture on Jesus, if you remember the the whole idea of taking our culture and trying to judge Jesus. Uh, you know, well, he didn't say this about slavery, he didn't say that about mm -hmm. slavery, and, and so forth, and we had all these, uh, you know, difficulties, but why didn't he say those things about slavery? Clearly, mm -hmm. Jesus associated with slaves themselves. Whatsoever you do to these least ones, you do unto me. Right. So Jesus proclaims that slaves have the same dignity, indeed, the, the dignity of being in his own divine image as everybody else. That was Jesus Christ. Now, you know, can Je could Jesus put an end to uh, the institution of slavery? No. Mm -hmm. Could uh, St. Paul do that? No. But they sure undermined it. Mm -hmm. And they undermined it instead of with their words, they undermined it through their actions. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same thing. So the, the, the church really did educate the slaves, really did give e health care to the slaves. Nobody else wanted to. Everybody else felt, I mean, that letter to, uh, you know, to Philemon, clearly, you know, Paul is saying, you know, he's my brother. He's like me, you know. There's no difference between us. Treat him like you would treat me, mm -hmm. you know. And so you, you can see that the idea of slavery, you know, the Christian Christian church is, is certainly undermining it, mm -hmm. but, you know, if it were to try and come out and, and say something, else, it would have done no good whatsoever because quid quid recipit or whatever is received is received right. in the manner of the receiver. It just couldn't have been heard at the time. But Christian efforts were ultimately successful and slavery was under overturned uh, in the ancient world and I think gr in great part mm -hmm. due to Christianity. Well, do you think in some ways, and first of all, there's this progressive idea that there's nothing to be learned from the past because we're smarter than they are as we move forward, but also the idea of, as you mentioned, this misunderstanding that the reason we have these kinds of positive humanistic ideas about people comes out of Christianity. And as you drive Christianity yeah. out of the public f 
space or the public forum, you're seeing less and less of this kind of uh, Christian approach to things where things get very violent. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, you know, I've said many, many times, you know, the idea of individualism, the idea that the individual makes a difference before God, that the indi every individual life is important outside the group, was the law made for man or man made for the law, right? Jesus' clear answer is, uh, you know, that the law was made for man, not vice versa, where uh, the individual human being is not subservient uh, to, you know, a, a, a law, or certainly a positive law outside of um, themselves. And so when you look at these things, uh, you know, Jesus clearly is initiating uh, this thought of the uh, value of every individual. And this uh, continues in St. Paul. It continues in St. Augustine, right? An unjust law is no law at all. Mm -hmm. That means that the law, the positive law that's, that's legislated, the law that comes from human beings, has to be subservient and responsible to justice. Justice is the higher principle, not the positive law. The positive law cannot just be despotically legislated independently of justice. And of course, this, this has been cited by many, many people. This goes all the way to the time St. Thomas Aquinas' natural law, and of course, finally with the, the Jesuit uh, Francisco Suarez in, uh, in De Legibus, where he actually Actually, he is the one, this is a Jesuit, who actually is the one who's the watershed for um, um, uh, individual inalienable rights mm -hmm. of life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness uh, in De Legibus. And that was read, by the way, by Hugo Grotius, who is the father of international law. And Hugo Grotius uh, gave it, uh, of course, to the, basically the world, including uh, t uh, John Locke, who was the first one to receive it in the Second Treatise on Government, and then finally, of course, to Thomas Jefferson. So, I mean, this comes, now you say, well, Thomas Jefferson wasn't a Catholic, uh, and he was basically a deist. Yes, mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson was a deist, but he took these ideas from Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, John Locke was a Christian. Uh, Hugo Grotius was a definite Christian. Mm -hmm. Francisco Suarez was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And Bartolome de las Casas, who was the, the really the father of human personhood for every human being, uh, you know, the great defender of the Indians in the New World, the Dominican friar, he uh, obviously was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, well, we see that this comes right down through Christian submission. And, of course, Thomas Jefferson did not invent inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. He takes it from Locke and Grotius, who took it from Suarez, and, of course, Suarez having taken the ideas, he was the watershed, of course, but uh, he took the ideas from uh, Aquinas and Augustine and St. Paul. Right, absolutely. Okay, let's... Uh, and Jesus let's... Christ, ultimately. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, that's where it all comes from, right? Uh, obviously. Yeah, as, right. A, as a child of God, you have these inalienable rights. So let's have some uh, questions from our audience for sure. you. Dear Father Spitzer, with the recent July 4th celebration, could you remind your viewers of something I recently discovered? There's an archdiocese for military services in the U.S. headed by Archbishop Timothy Brolio. And I want to say EW10 has done a lot of work with them, and they're, they're great. With more than yeah. 300,000 Catholics between the ages of 18 and 29 on active duty, this organization provides the chaplains who accompany service members and their families on their spiritual journey while serving their country. It's amazing work they do, and they deserve our prayer and support. So Joy in Arizona, we wanted to make sure we gave a shout-out to the... Uh, Archdiocese for the military. You bet, and not only the Archdiocese for the military, but all of our good military chaplains out there, good priests who have really sacrificed themselves and uh, joined the military to join our uh, service uh, uh, men and women on their uh, spiritual journey. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think it's a wonderful thing to, to give an acknowledgement to. Right, especially at this, this time of year. Uh, next up, Dear Father Spitzer, now on a recent program, you discussed confession. Now, I understand you to say that before a person can enter heaven, they must spend time in purgatory for all past sins, including those that were confessed. I thought when the priest gave you absolution, those sins were gone and forgiven. I'm confused on this now. Could you touch on this subject again? Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, Kenny, if I, I, I didn't say that all people would have to spend time in purgatory. I'm sorry if I you know, maybe implicit, implied it and maybe you... 
uh, took it in the wrong way, but I certainly didn't mean it. Um, no, there's uh, such a thing as a perfect contrition. Mm -hmm. uh, you could go into the confessional, honestly, you could uh, say a perfect contrition. You might be uh, uh, completely purified from your sins, and you could go straight to heaven, as many of our saints do. So um, I'm sorry if you took my words to be that. I certainly didn't mean it. Um, so that's the first point that, that should be made. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point is, is that you know, purgatory, I've, I've never maintained that purgatory is a place where you have to get punished for right. your sins. Mm -hmm. I've always held the opposite position. So, if again, if I confused you, I'm sorry. Purgatory is a uh, the state or place of uh, what we might call purification. Mm -hmm. Just, um, uh, and, and what happens there is we have to let go of the stuff that is holding us back. Uh, I just call it your basic ed, eight deadly sins, right? So uh, um, we, we have to, you know, let go of these things and they're sometimes very hard to let go of. So I might have said something like, I think I'm gonna spend time in purgatory. I need a little purification. I think when I die, uh, I might be still gripping uh, onto, you know, some of my pride, gripping onto some of my mm -hmm. anger, et cetera. So I, I, I think that I might have said that, but no, purgatory is really a place of purification. It is not a place where you are getting punished for past sins. Mm -hmm. um, and it's certainly not a place where God has to punish you for bat past sins that are forgiven, particularly if you had a perfect act of contrition and, and, and if you've been purified. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I hope I never uh, said anything like that or implied it, but if you took it that way, Kenny, I, I apologize it and apologize for it, and I just simply say never meant it in that way at all. Just absolutely the opposite. Purgatory is a place of purification where God just gently pries our fingers off, and uh, you know sometimes it is painful. There's just mm -hmm. no question. We don't want to let go of the stuff to which we're attached, mm -hmm. and so um, um, it's it may be a tough road out there. Uh, to, to follow and there there might be some real pain in there but at the end of the day we will be purified and we will, will be the more joyful for it. So when we, we talk about confession we, we talk about the forgiveness of sins then we also talk about temporal punishment. What do we mean by that? Well temporal punishment uh, you know generally refers to uh, the, you know, uh, punishment that is due for sins, mm -hmm. but uh, y you know, uh, you know the idea that this uh, you know is a strict application, that it has to be, you know, meted out, you know, as as Saint Augustine would probably say, please Lord, don't mete out mm -hmm. my just deserts, the temporal punishment due to my sins, mm -hmm. and there's nothing in church teaching that says that it has to be meted out. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I really believe that the saints, uh, just because of their lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, have already been purified. And in that purification, whatever temporal punishment mm -hmm. was due to them has been released by the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. So um, remember, temporal punishment is due to sin. Right. It doesn't have to be meted out Right. Uh, because um, it has to be meted out. God can dispense with it if he thinks that you're purified and ready to enter right. uh, into the kingdom of heaven. And I think in the case of all the saints, he does. Like the unitive way or something, or even we think of yeah, the expiation sure. of sins for some of the saints in the sense that they kind of seem to have gone through their purgation here on earth. Oh, yeah, and I think that's really true. I think that I've always you know, said that uh, the more we do the purgation on earth, the less we have to do it in the, in, in the next life. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, anyway, um, uh, good point and uh, okay. um, you know, I think uh, uh, it's not just the, the canonized saints that, uh, you know, uh, for which, uh, right. you know, purification is done. I think there's just a lot of unheralded, right. unheralded saints as well. Speaking of confession, you've, uh, you've hit, hit a topic yeah. here for people. Hi, okay. Father Spitzer. Okay. Now, on a recent program, you addressed a question about the need of confessing sins for our youth. If they come to mind in our old age, we're not sure they were ever confessed. You said that if they come to mind, go ahead and confess them. I went to confession and confessed past sins from some years ago. The priest said that all my past sins are forgiven whether I confess them last time or not. Is this true? Thanks, Christopher. 
Yes, it is true that if you tried to make a good confession at the time you tried to make that, mm -hmm. uh, let's suppose you, you committed um, a series of sins, uh, and maybe some of them were serious sins in y your youth. And let's suppose you just, you know, you made a good examination of conscience, you tried to confess your sins, but you just really didn't view it as a sin or it just didn't come up in your examination of conscience and you got you received absolution and you really tried to, to do your best to to, to to recall your sins um, as best you could mm -hmm. yes you are forgiven for those sins the reason I just said oh, go ahead and confess them is not because you have to uh, because if that would you know uh, help people to to feel like you know they're more deeply purified uh, you know that those have been brought to the Lord please go ahead and, and do that. Just, mm -hmm. you, you can say that. And, and sometimes I, I have to admit, you know, my own confessor will say, you know, you've been forgiven for those sins. And I know, I just say, yes, I know, but I, I just, I, I, I just w want to bring them here. I just want to send them before the Lord. I want right. to put them there. I just, uh, it's part of my purification process. I'm not confessing this out of scrupulosity. I, mm -hmm. I just want to do it as part of my own purification process. And, and so, I've, yeah, my, I've had confessors who just say, you know, and I always say, I know. But it's just, it's just me. I like to do it for purification, not right. out of a sense of scrupulosity. I don't think God's going to say, aha, uh -huh, you forgot when you were an idiot at 16 to confess this, and now... Uh, and you didn't confess it for the, the, the next 60 years or whatever, so now you're going to pay. I mean, right. obviously, that is not our God, and that's certainly not, the, uh, you know, the Father of Jesus Christ, et cetera. Well, um, you know, that's you, not the, you, the you God of the Catholic Church. Scrupulosity is probably not one of the major plagues of our church and society at this time, I wouldn't think. That's right, but there are some. I right, mean, I know, but... Uh, there are some, oh my right. gosh who just suffer so deeply from it. But, uh, oh, nothing like St. Ignatius of Loyola, probably. I mean, mm -hmm. wow, that guy at Manresa, he, he suffered from scrupulosity, almost to the point, honestly, of, of you, know, you know, on the brink of suicide. I mean, he wouldn't, didn't, you know, com, you know right. start to commit suicide or anything. But he, he, he was, a, mm -hmm. a, you know, just on the brink of despair, I mean. Uh, when he was there in the cave, and finally God released him from that right. sense and just gave him a revelation of his unconditional mercy that enabled him to, to move forward. Uh, but yeah, uh, that, that was, uh, uh, you know, quite a while ago, <laughs> right, right. you know, you right. go back 500 years here. So. Well, I used to laugh sometimes uh, in the 70s and 80s when I'd hear certain people in the church talk about, I think we talk too much about sin, and I'm thinking, I haven't heard of much about sin in the last 20 years. But anyway, <laughs> I've seen a lot of it. Yeah. I've probably done a lot of it, but yeah. I haven't heard very many people talk about it. So, so here's another question yeah. for you, Father. Dear Father Spitzer, now I received uh, communion as a child, but was never confirmed. I recently told that I needed to be confirmed before receiving the other sacraments like confession. Do I need to be confirmed before going no. to confession, even if I believe myself no. in a state of mortal, not in the state of mortal sin? And, uh, it's no, right? I mean, obviously, uh, yeah. even growing up no, as a kid, we no, actually I think, had uh, confession before we had yeah. confirmation, anyway. So. Oh yeah, no. In fact, uh, uh, very typically, the uh, now there is a new protocol uh, that that you know some bishops are implementing, where you do all three: the Eucharist, uh, confession, confirmation together. Right. Um, that I think uh, Bishop Paprocki and maybe. Um, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure of uh, all the bishops who are right, doing it, right. but I think there are at least four or five that are doing it in the United States. Now, the typical way, and the, the way that happened to me, mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, I, I re did Sacrament of Reconciliation first, Eucharist second, and then way later in the seventh and eighth grade, right, right because I received uh, uh, Reconciliation, Eucharist in the second grade, and then in seventh and eighth, I went through my confirmation training, was confirmed in the eighth. Right. So that was uh, very, very typical, mm -hmm. and um, it still is in many, uh, right. m many dioceses today. A lot of dioceses have gone up to high school for confirmation. So it's not true at all, and don't worry about that. 
Uh, but if you have a chance to get confirmed, uh, uh, you don't have to necessarily be confirmed by your bishop. Your bishop can delegate that to mm -hmm. your parish priest, and you could get confirmed uh, at um, uh, right. you know some time of his and your choosing. Um, because obviously, you, it sounds like you've lived a, a really good life uh, before the Lord all these years. Why not get confirmed and get those graces of the Holy Spirit that come with it? You can check out through your local RCIA if they have that. Sometimes they even have yeah, programs exactly. where for people who are already halfway in, so to speak, and are in the church, yeah, but exactly. just are missing confirmation, and that can even be expedited. So here's mm -hmm. another question yes, for you, Father Spitzer. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, now I'm a Methodist and my church is closing. I feel a spiritual pull towards the Catholic Church. Praise God. Yeah. How can I find out how to become a Catholic? Do I need to go to confession before I can enter the church? In the meantime, can I pray the rosary and the chaplets? Thank you, Billy. Yeah, Billy, you can play, absolutely pray the rosary and the chaplets and keep doing that. But I would encourage you, um, you know, there are several Catholic parishes around where you live. And um, uh, just uh, you might want to just contact um, one of those parishes. You probably don't, you know, know anybody. I know this kind of uh, odd kind of, <laughs> trying to move to a church when you don't know anybody. You're kind of uh, being pulled toward the Catholic Church. Um, my one thought would be to just give uh, uh, a parish nearby you, probably the closest parish um, near where you live. Um, and just give a call to them and just say, you know, I'd like to, to just join your RCIA program, mm -hmm. um, you, know, um, uh, you know, at the earliest convenience. And, uh, um, and it, you know, if you're a couple weeks late, sometimes they will uh, uh, bring you into it anyway. Uh, right now, I think you could probably do your first few classes, I hate to say this, online mm -hmm. uh, in RCIA because a lot of them have been uh, uh, right. put online uh, through the COVID crisis. But um, in any case, uh, you just, all you really need to do is get to RCIA. You certainly don't have to, uh, basically, getting the sacrament of reconciliation is part of coming into the Catholic Church, not vice versa. So you don't have to go to confession to uh, become a Catholic. You just need to go through the RCIA program. They'll then uh, get you baptized. Uh, well, if you're validly baptized in a Protestant church, you wouldn't be baptized. You would be confirmed. And prior to that time, uh, you would have your first confession. And uh, then you would receive Holy Communion, probably mm -hmm. on Easter Vigil, uh, unless there's some COVID interruption of that again. Mm -hmm. But that's normally the time uh, when you would come in. But I would. Uh, absolutely recommend it, Billy. Right. Just get into your uh, nearest parish, uh, and people will be very welcoming to you. And um, just um, uh, uh, you know, uh, go into the RCIA classes. And I know it's going to seem so strange because of the COVID problems, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't even wait until COVID's over. I, I would, I would just go ahead and uh, right. sign up, do some of the online things. I'm pretty sure the vaccinations are going to be prolific uh, by January, so. I, I think, you know, you can, they'll start up the classes in earnest uh, by then, if not before. Okay. Very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, another question. Are there sins that are beyond forgiving, like suicide cases have increased during this pandemic, and I fear for these souls? Caroline, and that is a, a concern even for people being kind of cooped up in uh, the rise in suicides. Yeah. But what about the yeah. forgiveness of those kinds of sins? Yeah, there, there, no, no sin is beyond forgiving. <laughs> the only sin that's beyond forgiving is to say that, uh, you know, I'm beyond forgiving and then you slip right into despair, right? Uh, mm -hmm. that, that would be terrible. But no, there's no sin beyond, that, that is beyond forgiving. So that's the first point. The second point that's uh, really clear is, let's suppose you do have a person who is extremely depressed and desperate in, in their own minds and and does something terrible like uh, commit suicide. Uh, my main thought would be remember that definition of mortal sin. It requires sufficient knowledge and full consent of the will. 
So the, the, the full consent and complete consent of the will means no impediments to the free use of the will. And in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it mentions those, uh, those two conditions. It gives you several of the conditions uh, that can be impediments to the free use of the will, one of which can be you know, psychological inhibition, emotional inhibition, not just, uh, you know, could be serious depression, could be, um, you know, um, bipolar disorder, could mm -hmm. be a variety of different things where, you know, a person truly is not free. Uh, they're just truly being motivated by subconscious and, and, and conscious difficulties that are impeding them. So uh, I would read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, just look up conditions for mm -hmm. mortal sin, Catechism of the Catholic Church on your computer, and you'll see those things there. But the point is, a lot of suicides are frankly uh, during, uh, happen during depression uh, or a despair mm -hmm. that's coming from depression. They just can't manage life and they're, they're, they give up. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not free, they're, they just feel like they're compelled uh, almost in, into that. And I know, uh, you know, I don't want to be too loose on excusing uh, suicides in, in mm -hmm. the sense that, you know, maybe they are slightly free. You don't ever want to commit, even contemplate suicide under any circumstances. But really, um, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody does, you know, you have to believe that, that God will help them. And of course, I always go back to the cure of ours where that guy is jumping off the bridge mm -hmm. and uh, on his way down, he just goes, oh my gosh. I'm sorry, Lord, this is the worst mistake of my life, but he was as loose, lucid as he could be. And um, the Lord reveals to the curé of ours that this guy had repented on the way down, you know, into the, uh, he did die mm -hmm. uh, from jumping off the bridge, but um, he had repented and the curé of ours uh, came back and told, I think it was one of his relatives uh, that, uh, no, maybe it was uh, his spouse that uh, he had repented. Right, right. Very good. With that being said, we're going to take a break here with Father Spitzer in the midst of his universe. Much more ahead, we're going to be talking about why the Catholic Church is the place you should be. And we have much more ahead as we stay here on Father Spitzer's universe. Stay with us. A couple more questions, too, perhaps. And thank you so much for staying right where you are. We're right here in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe, of course. And one thing I wanted to mention, uh, you know, we have a wonderful EWTN app. You can watch Father Spitzer's show live. You can watch the replay. We've got so many different things available. Over 1.2 million downloads and counting. So uh, make yourself part of that group. We want people to know, we hate to brag a little bit, but it's out there. It's a wonderful app. Everybody's been using it for years, and uh, we wanted to give a little shout out to our wonderful team, Jeff Hahn and all his people online who helped to put this together, and Len Marino's team for promoting it, and 1.2 million Catholics can't be wrong, so you may want to check that out. Okay, and we turn once again to uh, Father Spitzer. Uh, just wanted to throw a little bit of thing out there that we're, you know, EW10's on the cutting edge there too. We're out in that new technology world, so. Uh, That's right, no, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Mother would be proud, I'm sure. I'm, she, I'm sure she oh, is yeah. proud. So. Here's yeah. a couple other questions for you quick before we get to the topic. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, how can God have perfect justice while also showing mercy? It would seem that the two are contradictory. When God shows mercy to someone, the justice due would be negated, and this would not be perfect. This is from Heather. Heather, uh, here's the quick uh, answer to that. Um, justice for the Greeks was equality. That is true. So DK, right, would, would be basically pictured by the scales. And so that was a very, very typical Greek approach uh, to these things. However, um, in Jesus' Semitic culture and for Jesus himself, the idea of justice was not equated, as it were, no pun intended, with equality. Mm -hmm. It was not in, uh, even equated with equity. Uh, justice instead was 
uh, basically conceived of in terms of righteousness before God. Mm -hmm. That's a very different concept. Oh, okay. It's not part of our legal concept. So, so uh, uh, dikaiosune, you can hear dk, dikaiosune, right? It, you know, righteousness is, is, righteousness before God is, is what, you know, God's justice is. And God's justice trumps what we might call our legal equality oriented view of justice. So when we talk about, you know, God as being perfectly just, we mean that he's perfectly just in terms of bringing about righteousness. Mm -hmm. Righteousness, remember, is readiness for salvation. The purity of heart, right, the, the authenticity before God that's, that makes you ready for salvation. Mm -hmm. So that's a very different view uh, of justice, and we just got to cut out, unfortunately, uh, Plato and Aristotle here for a moment, mm -hmm. and we just have to zoom over to Jesus. So he sees then that when, when he says, you know, God's, when we talk about perfect justice from Jesus' point of view, it, it's the perfect way to righteousness, right? It's the perfect manifestation of soul for getting to heaven for going for salvation so that's what justice would be and in that case perfect justice is mm -hmm. perfect mercy because perfect mercy is what leads um, you know to salvation mm -hmm. so there's there's no contradiction whatsoever but it, if you start with Plato's definition of justice right uh, giving each man his due or each person his due or you start with Aristotle's notion of justice which is really equity mm -hmm. right uh, you're you're gonna get into a real you know, stubborn Gordian knot, and you're not going to okay. be able to get out of it because it's just apples and oranges. Right. Okay. Well, we can spend some time on the Gordian knot there and explain uh, <laughs> Alexander and his right. sword. Quick way of fixing it, right? Yeah. Uh, right. Why untie yeah. it if you can just cut it open, right? So here's yeah, one other exactly. question before we go to uh, to the topic. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. Dear Father Spitzer, a husband and wife are deeply in love for many years. They both die and one goes to heaven, the other goes to hell. How can the one in heaven enjoy eternal unending happiness knowing their spouse must endure unending pain and suffering? George. Well, George, um, you know, that's a common question. Mm -hmm. But uh, two things need to be considered when you, you start asking, you know, sort of these hard case questions. Mm -hmm. The number one question is, uh, if the husband and wife are deeply in love for many, many years, it's got to be premised on something, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say uh, they're deeply in love because they're in agreement on what uh, purpose in life is. And, you know, it's hard for somebody to be uh, deeply in love with somebody when you have radical disagreements on what purpose in life is, what is happiness, et cetera. So if I'm happiness level one or happiness level two, it's really going to be hard for me mm -hmm. to stay in a deeply loving, committed relationship with someone who's level three and level four. Even the level three, level four person may be very accepting, but the level one, level two person is going to not like the commitments of the level three and level four. But remember, level three is contributive happiness, and level four is um, uh, you know faith-based happiness, right? Based on prayer, based on salvation. So you you know when you get right down to it. Uh, you've got um, a, a radical disagreement. So when you say deeply in love, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Because there are, just as there are four levels of happiness, four levels of purpose in life, there's also four levels of love too that flow out from that. And so when you mean deeply in love, I gotta ask you, what do you mean by love? Do you mean love one, love two, love three, or love four? And if they were deeply in love in terms of love three and love four, I gotta tell you, odds are the husband's up there with the wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're, they're not, mm -hmm. uh, if one of them's <clears throat> love one and love two, the other one's love three and love four, uh, that's gonna be hard to apply the, the adverb deeply to. Right. So uh, I, I just have to tell you, just from the get-go, the question has intrinsic weaknesses, almost right. to the point of incoherency, mm -hmm. if you don't have some agreement on love. But there's a second dimension to it. You have to remember, you don't go to hell without your choice being part of it. So uh, right, if somebody chooses radical separation from God, from love, and from the blessed, 
um, you know, from Jesus Christ. It says, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And they, their, their lives betray that and their, 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 their free choice is moving in the direction mm -hmm. uh, away from God. And the other spouse is moving in the direction toward God. Uh, again, there's going to be dissonance in mm -hmm. the marriage. I mean, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, you know, that, you know, the, the spouse that goes to heaven cannot have, make the free choices necessary for a spouse that, for example, went to hell. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, it's, it's a matter of their free choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the key point to remember is not that you can just cavalierly dismiss this because if you cared about something, you couldn't possibly want that for anybody. If you loved somebody, uh, and especially at level three and level four, and, you, and you, you see them moving away from it, the first thing you do is try everything in your power to prevent them from continuing to move down a path that moves away from God, that moves away from love, that moves away from the blessed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the idea of deeply in love, I think there's going to be real dissonance between wow. a person who is utterly committed to going to heaven, utterly committed to the love of Jesus Christ, utterly committed to contribute, uh, you know, uh, identity and, and meaning in life versus a person who's mm -hmm. ego comparative, materialistic and pleasure oriented, mm -hmm. you know, level one and level two. And, and so, you know, there's, I'm not going to say, you know, that, um, you know, it's again applying the word deeply mm -hmm. uh, to, to that relationship, you know, how deep can it be with a radical disagreement, one going in one direction, the other right. going in another direction. Yes, you can care about that person deeply, you right. can pray for that person, but uh, don't count God out either. Uh, you know, before you say one went to heaven and the mm -hmm. other went to hell. You know, then you keep God out of the equation. God's right. in the equation. God listens to prayers. God hears pleas on behalf of people for mercy. And, and so, yes, if you have that one that's going to heaven, you can bet right. that they're probably praying for that person. God's listening to those prayers. But at the end of the day, it's the free choice of the person. Right. At the end right. of the day, that's going to determine what happens to them. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, well, I don't think they would be, in, in a sense, deeply happy with the fact that their spouse went to hell. Mm -hmm. But their spouse went to hell because that's what their spouse wanted. Right. That's what they chose, mm -hmm. even despite the fact that there were prayers to the contrary and so forth. It's not going to make you happier that they did it, but it m might I just say without, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, or writing it off. Hey, this it will come as probably no surprise. Right. Right. I mean, but like you said, I mean, what kind of deep connection yeah. could there be, you know, on a exactly. spiritual level between these people if, if you know, there's such oh, a divergence yeah. on, on their, yeah. on yeah. where they want to end up, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. There so for the a second, then really I, has I some... think they're going to end up playing doubles in heaven based on what you were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> One love, That's two right. love, three love. Uh, I, I, my guess yeah. is they're probably okay. So let's talk about what's yeah. so special about the Catholic Church. Uh, okay. And we're in the section here, the unconditional love of God, uh, which we've talked about a lot, and the prodigal mm -hmm. son. Mm -hmm. You say a majority of scholars acknowledge that Jesus' most profound revelation of his father is found in the parable of the prodigal son. And you mentioned the fact mm -hmm. uh, that you really need to understand it based on what a Jewish onlooker might have heard it as. Yeah. So explain that. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a great question. The, the, here's the thing with the uh, prodigal son. The, the father in the prodigal son is Jesus' definitive revelation mm -hmm. of who God his father is. There's a one-to-one, -one, you know, kind of, you know, equation there. You're looking at the father in the parable. You're looking at the heart of God. That's Jesus' intention. So just moving to the next step then, that Jesus sets up the parable so that the younger son cannot have done anything more uh, uh, you know, that would be considered wrong by the old covenant, right? Mm -hmm. He betrays and shames his family. He betrays and shames his Jewish election and his, and his uh, special call, the, the, the people, right? His, his people. He then betrays and shames his people again by going to the land of the Gentiles, the Goyim. And, and then what does he do there? He, 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 
shames God before the Gentiles, shames his religion before the Gentiles by spending all of his money on prostitutes and dissolute living and, and you know, his father's hard-earned money. And so you get a terrible example, but more than that, just betrays God, writes God off and, and so forth until he goes broke, the land experiences a famine. And then he's got to go to a Gentile farm. And on the Gentile farms, there's pigs. And he's got to live with the pigs, which are very unclean animals. So Jesus got all the bases covered. Mm -hmm. he's, he's terribly unclean, right? You touch a pig, you get pigness on you for life. I mean, now he's living with the pigs. He's so impure, you, you can't even imagine it. Jesus got the, you know, did he write off God? Wrote off God completely. Disobeyed Torah right and left. Wrote off his family completely. Wrote off his election, his country completely. Okay, the kids... Uh, as bad as you can get according to the first covenant nobody in the audience is thinking this kid has any redeemable features whatsoever but Jesus has a surprising turn the kid basically says oh my gosh I, this is a terrible horrible life I'm living how many of my father's servants have more than enough to live I've got it I'm gonna go down and wheedle my way in the back door I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against you and I no longer deserve to be called your son. Just treat me like one of your servants. I'll go in the back door. I won't wear a pair of sandals. I'll be one of the slaves. I don't care. I'm just, I, got, I want to go home. So he's got it. So the kid has contrition. He's humble, right? He, you know, he's going to eat humble pie. He's going to pay. But there's also this idea of, you know, maybe I can wheedle my way in the back door. I don't deserve it, but maybe he'll take me back in as a slave. So he goes back home. The father sees him coming from afar. Remember, this is your God. And the father sees him coming from afar. And what does he do? He rushes out to meet this kid who's done everything to harm him, mm -hmm. harm his religion, harm his relationship with God, harm his election as a Jewish person, the rituals of impurity. He's done everything to harm everything. Here this kid comes back, and the father just doesn't even wait for the speech. You know, you know, treat me like one of the servants. He rushes out to meet him, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. That's before anything happens. Then the son, right, just the act of coming home is enough for the father. He's so happy. That's your God. <clears throat> he sees you coming home. He's rushing out there to meet you. He's going to support you. He's going to bring you in. He's not interested in lecturing the boy at all. Mm -hmm. And the boy kneels in front of the father. Oh, that great Rembrandt painting, right? With uh, the father hugging that boy who's kneeling down. Mm -hmm. He says, Father, I've sinned against you. No longer deserve to be called your son. Stop. He's got the contrition. He, what does he say? Get um, a cloak and put it on him, right? Treat my son like royalty, right? Only aristocracies wear cloaks. And then give him some sandals, right? Uh, uh, you know, he, uh, free people wear sandals. Slaves are barefooted. So... <clears throat> Treat my boy like a free person. Once again, he's going in the front door. Mm -hmm. And then quick, get a ring and put it on his finger. The ring that has the family signet on it that just says, you belong to my family 100%. The father is taking him back into the family 100%. Nothing, no conditions, nothing. Takes him back in and then kills the fatted calf. That's who God is. Such a radical notion of, mm -hmm. of, of uh, uh, unconditional love that belongs to the heart of the Father. There's nothing like it in the whole history of religions. This is the most radical notion of God there is. Now, of course, he, Jesus continues. He says, hey, there's the older boy out there. Mm -hmm. And remember, the older boy represents the Pharisees, mm -hmm. right? He's the boy who's been a good kid all of the days of his life slaving out there in the fields he's like an observant pharisee he's a good kid now what happens that kid hears you know, ask one of the servants what's going on in dear with the party now that your brother has come back and your father's killed the fatted calf he's outraged he won't come back in the servant rushes over tells the father he won't come back in mm -hmm. the father here's your god again he comes in front of that kid, kneels before that kid, says he begs him, he pleads with him, right, by kneeling before him. No father does this, but this father does. There's your God. He's so anxious to have his older son, so anxious to have the Pharisees come in the front door too, that he kneels and begs before him, and he lets that son, that Pharisee, give him what for, right? The, you never gave me so much as a kid glove to celebrate with my friends. And here... 
this son of yours who's been a wretch all his life and has done all these things to you, you take him back in and kill the fatted calf? I'm so angry. I'm so livid. I can't stand you. And the father says gently to that son, son, you have been with me always. And then he pledges the whole rest of his estate right then and there. No time separation. He doesn't have to wait till the father dies. Everything I have is yours. Mm -hmm. I'm giving it to you. But that brother of yours, he was lost and is found. He was dead and has come back to life. So it's now the choice of the Pharisee. The Pharisee can sit in his self-righteousness and he can, he, we don't know the end of the story. Uh, Jesus doesn't say what the Pharisee, uh, what the, the older boy does, but I, I always presume he, went, he goes back in the house. He, just to, to hold a grudge against his brother, mm -hmm. he's not going to turn down that entire estate uh, mm -hmm. with the father kneeling before him. It, it would be crazy to do it. And, and so Jesus is saying, that's who the father is. Abject humility, abject compassion, abject forgiveness, uh, well, not abject, but you know, pure forgiveness, unconditional forgiveness, unconditional love. And, and so he's, he's just, you know, uh, the purity of heart Again, the most radical view of, of unconditional love, radical view of, of God in the whole history of religions, which was absolutely transformative. And we'll have to talk about it in a, another program. But mm -hmm. this, this idea of God, this idea of divine mercy trumping everything, this idea of divine mercy uh, you know, trumping everything for us, our need to imitate divine mercy and giving compassion to others, even when we have a grudge against them, right? Jesus' is in priority on forgiveness, so important. I mean, this is absolutely key to everything that the Christian church is premised on, and it animates the Christian church just as the resurrection animates the, the Christian church, Jesus' resurrection and that's the message that goes out to all the earth. That's the message then that it, the Christian church takes to the sinners, right? Jesus spends a huge amount of his time preaching to sinners. Mm -hmm. And the reason he does is because he came to call sinners. He says it himself, not the righteous. So what does he do? I mean, the Pharisees are just scratching their heads. They cannot believe this. You're hanging out with sinners. They're going to pollute you. You're eating at their table. You're eating mm -hmm. their food. You eat their, <clears throat> their food. It's going to pollute you. <clears throat> So he's basically saying, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm just telling you right now, um, this is not the logic of God. This is your logic. <clears throat> this is your man-made logic. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get polluted. I came here to share the purity of heart, the love of God the Father, which is my love, which I'll give unconditionally on the cross. Of course, he doesn't say mm -hmm. that to the Pharisees right then and there, but he's got it in mind. And, of course, at the end of the day, he does, uh, you know, give... A, a, you know, forgiveness to these sinners. He brings them back into the fold. And then when the Pharisees come in, try and bust his chops and say, hey, mm -hmm. what do you think you're doing? You know, and Jesus goes, hey, you f scribes and Pharisees, you fools, you brood of vipers, you know, you, um, you know, lay heavy burdens on men's shoulders, but you don't even lift a finger to budge them. So in other words, he's, he's basically saying you can't just simply go around closing off the kingdom of God to people who have sinned. Mm -hmm. You have to give them a second chance and a third chance and a seventh chance and a seven times 70 chance of coming back into the kingdom of God. This is the, uh, the heart of the Father. This is the will of the Father. Keep forgiving and forgiving again just as your Father does and you will get the mercy of God at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus doesn't relent. He keeps on saying it, but again, radical 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 and of course the idea of Greek justice that we just talked about is trumped mm -hmm. by forgiveness and mercy and compassion uh, definitely uh, the golden rule uh, we'll talk about this later will trump the the, the right. silver rule and it's, it's going to change society it's going to change everything uh, in the history of religions and of course not just change the history of religions but change secular culture as well that little Christian church which turns around and converts the, the empire of Rome, will wind up changing everything precisely because of this teaching of Jesus. Right. And there's, there's so many things we want to talk about on this particular yeah. parable, and I want to ask you some questions too, but we're, sure. we're, we're virtually sure. running out of time. 
uh, <laughs> uh, for this particular show. So I think we're going to have to wrap up because we don't really okay. have any time to get very deep. So, uh, Father, if you would give us your blessing on the way out the door, that'd be great. Will we'll do. And may uh, bow your heads and pray for God's blessings. And may the Lord of all compassion, mercy, and love sink ever more deeply into your hearts that you may have the confidence to know of his love for you to continue to go to the sacrament of reconciliation, to continue to repent for your sins, to continue to receive uh, our Lord in, in, in the Holy Eucharist, to continue to move on the path of salvation so that your heart opens more and more to become the heart of the Father with each passing day and so that you might enjoy the joy of the heavenly kingdom promised by Jesus who said, I give you all these things, I tell you all these things that my love, may, that my joy may be yours and your joy may be complete. May that love and joy be yours forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next week. Stay safe. And just a reminder to our audience out there, the wonderful books and DVDs available from Father Spitzer through our EWTN Religious Catalog. You can check those out. we got a fine bookmark coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, you can check that out as well. That's Carmelite Spirituality, a way of Carmelite prayer and contemplation with Cardinal Anders Albarilis. Uh, it's an interesting interview. He's a, he's a great man. And don't forget about our wonderful uh, downloads are available through our app. And don't forget, if you want to check out Father Spitzer's show on our YouTube channel and also on Bookmark on YouTube, check that as well. We've got more Catholic videos online than anybody in the universe. And I can say that from the heart of Father Spitzer's universe. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time.